Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You guys rested up and ready for today? You ready to live your best life yet? Because we're only in November, right? Uh, we're back in this series, like you said, living your best life. And I, you know, the reason why we chose this topic is because 2020 and 2021 was difficult, right? Remember in 2020, we were like, boy, I can't wait till this year's over. And then 2021 came along and we're like, I can't wait till 2022. I mean, because, you know, the COVID, the COVID, got the COVID, the COVID, and then this year with the inflation, it just seems so hard that nobody, and, you know, shortage of everything, nobody knows what normal is anymore. But the reason why we chose this series is because we believe that you can live your best life ever, no matter what's going on around you, as long as you're living a life that's intentional, a life of intentionality. And the cool thing about that is you don't have to be a Jesus follower. It's not a God thing. You know, you could be watching online right now, kind of checking this whole thing out. And uh, it's, it, it doesn't matter whether what you believe about God, you can still live a life of purpose. You can still live the best life ever if you're intentional about your life. And we really believe that. And that's why we say this all the time here. In fact, you may be here this morning and you're not sure about God, the whole Jesus thing. Someone invited you. Maybe they promised you lunch. Maybe she's really hot and you're like, okay, I'll go to church, you know, whatever it is. Um, here's what we say all the time. You don't have to believe to belong. You don't have to believe what we believe to come here. There's always a seat for the table, and, the reason, and we, we didn't make this up. This is how Jesus lived his life. Jesus, met every, Jesus would meet all these people, and he didn't go, well, you know, if you change your life, if you change what you believe, if you believe that I'm the Son of God, you can follow me around. No, you, it, it, didn't, it wasn't like that at all. all he, everyone he met, he would just go, follow me. Because in the following, they could check out his claims and see if what he said was true, and then most of them or many of them end up believing. And so we want to try to create that attractive environment that people that maybe don't even believe what we believe still want to be around us. And if that's you, we're so glad that you're here. Now, what does it mean to live a life of intentionality? Well, it could mean a whole lot of things. I mean, there's a whole lot of things that we can talk about. But today what I wanna do is I wanna talk about this being intentional by adding joy to the journey. And when I say journey, I got a lot of birthday wishes this week because I'm kind of a big deal. My office smells like rich mahogany and leather bound books. And uh, so I got a lot of birthday wishes and some of them would be like, hey, I hope your journey around the sun was a great one. You know, that whole equivalent that every time you have a birthday, you journeyed around the sun one time. Well, it got me thinking that in the in, the, in your journey around the sun, the more times you go around, the more times you have to be intentional about adding joy to those journey because it seems like the more times you go around the sun, the more life seems to leak joy from your journey. Have you notice that? And so because of that, you have to be intentional about adding joy because there's things that naturally just put holes in your joy tank, just life itself, what's been happening in our culture, COVID, politics, have a way of leaking your joy. Getting on social media and, 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 and the news. All of those things. And even just life just seems to rob your joy. And then you get to a point where you wake up and you're 60 years old and you're not dead. That's a good thing. But you have no joy. And, and it seems like when we get, because the last two years have seemed so serious. COVID, the raging inflation, all of these things have seemed so serious that it's almost... Um, it's almost uh, counterintuitive to be a joyful person. It's almost like you have to make sure that you're serious because everything is so serious around us. It almost seems counterintuitive to have joy. And then what we do is we kind of, as, Christ, as Christ followers, or just individuals, we kind of add to this downward spiral because we walk around sending a message to the world with our face long before we say a word. Because the joy, our joy gets robbed, we walk around looking like that, and then we help contribute to the problem. It kind of reminds me, I've been dealing a lot with my father. I said last week, I had to put my father in, um, we had to get him in, not a nursing home, what do they call it? Assisted living. He's 86, he's gonna turn 87 this next month, and he insists on driving. He insisted on me getting him a smartphone. You know, I guess when he decided when he, when his wife died, he was gonna learn all these new things. He knew how to drive, he's actually pretty good at driving, but. He gets lost, and thank God I have him on this, you know, that I can track him. I called him the other day. He was on his way home. <laughs> this happened twice this week. He's on his way home from Pensacola, and he ends up past Freeport. And I'm like, call him, Dad, what are you doing? Coming back from Pensacola? No, you're almost to Ebro. You need to turn around, find a place to park, let me walk you through the phone thing. And then it got to where he kept missing his turn into his assisted living facility. I felt like I'm in the government, like, okay, take your next right. 
Okay, go down to the next street. It's called Crest. Oh, I'm at the water. You went too far. Come back, Dad. You know, and I'm leading, I'm leading him on the phone. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it reminds me of this because I, I heard this story when I was talking about my elderly father. Someone told me about taking their elderly mom out shopping at the commons, took her out of the assisted living, went over there, and all she did was complain the whole time. You know, oh, the crowd's too crowded. The price, it's so expensive. Oh, my feet hurt. And finally, they were walking out of a store, and when they walked out, the elderly mother said to her daughter, who's an adult daughter, probably in her 40s, said, uh, I'm never going back to that store again. She said, why not? She goes, did you see the dirty look that cashier gave me? And her daughter was like, you had that dirty look when you walked in. You didn't, she didn't give you anything, right? And see, we have to add, we are the only ones that can add joy to the journey because life is not programmed to give you joy. The things in life will not give you joy. So if we want to add joy to the journey, I'm telling you, the first thing we have to do is check our face. Yeah, thank you. I've got, I love you. I love you. Because here's what I want to tell you. Can I give you all some truth? Can I give you all some truth? Isn't it refreshing when a pastor tells you the truth? I love you too. Thank you very much. You do not know what it's like to be up here preaching and see some of your faces. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. I talk to other communicators and they all say the same thing and we're all in agreement. We try to find faces like yours to speak to, okay? Because others, I look at you and it looks like, I'm going to catch you outside after the service. <laughs> That's what I think when I see you, your faces, you know. And this is why, I don't know why some of the people that have these, this is why we have these bright lights, by the way, so I can't see some of y'all. I don't know why some of y'all that have those faces, like you want to catch me outside, sit on the front row. But if you see me doing this where I'm talking and I go like this, that's because you got you got that face, all right? I think that we need to um, have bouncers. And they don't check the IDs. They just look at your face and go, nope, sorry, you're in the balcony. <laughs> right? And I've asked people to sit on the front row, haven't I? I've asked people to sit on the front row. You know why? Because I want to focus on your face because your face is like, oh my gosh, you're the greatest. I love what you're saying. I'm so engaged. I'm taking notes. I lo- you're so good looking. See, I like that, all right? So just like in here, your physiology literally affects your environment. But it's a sickler thing because what happens is your environment affects you and then you get down, your environment, your culture, the politics, you get on Facebook, you read, go to CNN or Fox News or whatever, and then you get down and then you go walking around and it's robbed you of your joy and you walk around like that and then you wonder why no one wants to hang out with you or, well, you know, I invited them and they didn't want to come. Well, look at your face, right? Or... You can be intentional about adding joy to the journey, and when you do, it shows up on your face, and you become a burst of color, and this is what I mean by this. I was thinking about this the other day when I was talking about the staff. I was thinking about, because our cult, right now, in our 2020 and 2021, it just feels like if you lived in the Cold War, remember that anybody who grew up in the Cold War, and they would show pictures of the Soviet Union, and it was always gray and drab, and there was no color, and you know they wore gray coats, and it was like, there's the Soviet Union. We don't want communism. Look how gray and drab it is. And I just, I feel like our culture feels that way right now. It's just drab. And to have joy would be like bringing color to a drab world. In fact, we sing a song. We sang it last week. It says, see the sun bursting through the clouds, black and white, turns to color all around. And what's the name of the song? This is living now. That's why I'm not on the worship team. (laughs) But that's what it's about because joy When you add joy to the journey, it's like bringing color to a drab world. Now, here's the cool thing. God knew that that it worked this way. So when you go back to the Old Testament, this is what's really cool. In the Old Testament, when you look at the, the country of Israel, the Jewish people, God actually instituted mandatory times of feasts and celebration. There were actually seven that, were, that they had throughout the year, seven of them, that feast like um, Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Passover, all different ones. And they were basically just big, giant national parties. Think of Thanksgiving. 
everything's closed, you shut everything down, everyone comes to the Jer Jerusalem and it was just a big party. And it didn't matter how busy you were, it didn't matter what kind of mood you were in, the party was not optional, the priest didn't send out an invitation, hey, come to our feast, RSVP, hope you can make it, all right? It was a command, you stop everything, no matter how busy you were, no matter, you know, ain't nobody got time for that, yeah, you do, it's a big party, we're gonna, we're gonna party, like it's your birthday. We're gonna sit Bacardi like it's your birthday. That's what it was, right? You with me? Now, so he did these feasts like this for the whole country and they would come together and they would, basically it was a big party. Now I want you to understand this because I wanna go into one of those calls for a time of partying in the, in the Old Testament. Because we often think that the Jewish religion, you know, when you think about it, the first thing that comes to mind is kind of, there's so many rules, the 10 commandments, the 600 commandments, that it's boring, you know, the Jewish religion, but, and it's boring and holy, but they knew how to party. I'm telling you, you go there today, anybody been to Israel? They still know how to party. I mean, wine is a huge thing over there. I remember we went over there with a group of Christ followers from America, a group of Christians, a group of church people, and we were staying in what they call a kibbutz, which is like a community. And this community would be people who live there, and they all kind of share in different, uh, different things. They have their own homes. They have schools. They have hotels. They have restaurants. But it's in a, like a gated community. And they would teach you about some aspect of the Jewish culture. In fact, we learned how to make bread and milk goats and make cheese and stuff, how David would live. And I remember we were in the bar, this restaurant, we're in this restaurant, and one of the church people from America, a little, probably church lady, mm, Satan? No, she said, um, I notice y'all have a lot of alcohol. Like, wait, you're religious and you have alcohol? And he goes, yeah, what's the problem? She goes, oh, I guess it's okay as long as you don't get drunk. And the Jewish, he was a rabbi or something, goes, Hey, we drink, you get drunk, no problem. Who cares? What's, you're drunk, you know? They, he couldn't understand it. They know how to party, right? So I wanna, what I want to do, excuse me, is I want to look at this call to party, and it's in the book of Nehemiah. And in Nehemiah, a little background, they had been the, a group of what they call the remnant, there was a remnant of people that were still in Jerusalem. They started to rebuild their city, Jerusalem, because Jerusalem had been torn down and destroyed and devastated by their enemies. So they had a group of people that were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and because they were doing that, some of the surrounding uh, people did not want that to happen because when Jerusalem was in power, they were a, a superpower, so they didn't want that to happen. So they're having to fight while they're rebuilding their walls, they're rebuilding their homes, and they get it done in like a miraculous number of days, under like just over two months, right? And so they just finished this long, tense season of rebuilding their city, and Nehemiah gathers them all together, and here's what he says. Now, if you want to follow along, we have an app you can download, Shoreline app. They're going to flash that up there, and you can follow along with today's notes. Just a little reminder to turn, turn your phone on silent. And if you have your phone out, why don't you just go ahead and check into Facebook and tell people where you are. Okay, so this is Nehemiah, and here's what he does. He stands up in Nehemiah chapter 8. It says that Ezra who was the high priest, he opened the book, talking about the word of God, and all the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it up, as he opened it, the people all stood up. He said, the people all stood up. See, I like this, they're an interactive church, okay? They're kind of like, this is my kind of church. They don't just sit there and speak and you sleep, okay? It says, the people all stood up, and Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands Amen. and responded what? Amen. Yeah. Amen. You can go ahead and have a seat. I'm not gonna make you stand up the whole time. I'd like to, but I could tell that you probably couldn't handle it. <laughs> but I love this because again, it was an interactive, it was full of joy, it was expressive that when the priest stood up to read, they all stood up, they raised their hands, they were like, amen, or in our church we say it this way, Ew! Right? All right. So, and uh, then he goes, it says, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear. Is that the right one? Am I on the right one? Yeah, okay. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving meaning so that the people understood what was being read. That's super important. We hear that a lot here. I love Shoreline because you make it understandable. Because many times what people think is that if it's confusing, it must be deep. If I don't understand, it must be deep. And that's not true. You want to make the word of God understandable. And so it says they gave meaning to what was being read and they, and they made it understandable. Then Nehemiah the governor and Ezra the priest and the teacher of the law and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. So it's a holy day. 
He says, because of that, do not mourn or weep. See, now when we think holy, don't we naturally go to, it's holy, oh, oh, filling me bony belly for Nabisco selleth all his dominoes. It's holy, shh, it's holy, shh, solemn, right? He's like, no, no, this is a holy day. So don't cry, stop weeping, this is a holy day. No mourning, no weeping. He says, it's a holy day. He says, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So I don't really have time to get into a lot of this, but there was, you gotta remember, this culture had, was a lamenting culture. It was a lament, they had a lam, lamenting tradition, a, a mournful, it was a mournful culture. They even had a book on, called Lamentations on how to lament, okay? But at the same time, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, there's a time to mourn and there's a time to dance. So even though they had a tradition of lamenting and mourning, they also had a tradition of partying. But it says they had been weeping as they listened to God's word because they realized just how far they had gotten away from God and the reproach that they'd come, so it caused them to weep. Like, anybody remember the story of the prodigal son? Jesus told the story about what his father was like. He said a, son, a father had two sons, and one of them, the youngest one, asked for his inheritance and got, half of his inherit, got his inheritance, half of the father's inheritance, and went away to Vegas and blew it all. And then he had no money, no friends. His pet's heads were falling off and decided, and he came to his senses and went, said, what am I doing here? And he began to sob and weep because, he, because of what he'd blown. That's what it's talking about. These people, they heard the word and said, God, where have we gone? And then they came back. And in the story of the prodigal son, when he comes back, the dad doesn't cry. The dad says, let's party. Why? Because my son is home. It's not the time to weep, it's a time to party. So they've been lamenting, they've been weeping because they heard the word and said, man, look how far we've fallen. Now we're back, we've rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, we've rebuilt our homes, we're getting back into a relationship with God. Let's party. And it says, so Nehemiah said, because of that, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing. So he says, we're back. Basically, you know, we got a nice little festival coming or a feast holiday coming up in a couple weeks called what? Thanksgiving, which is where we get this from. It's let's get all, let's grab. Do you think that when our forefathers were maybe deciding about Thanksgiving, they go, hey, what'd they do in the Bible? Let's close everything, even Walmarts, and let's have a big feast and celebrate what God's done. This is one of the reasons why Thanksgiving Day Your church, Shoreline Church, we are going into what we are calling 40 days of cheer and goodwill. We're going to start it on this holiday when we're going to be thankful and grateful for what God has done for us, when we're supposed to look back and go, wow, look what God has done through this time of COVID. Look what God has done through this time of inflation. Look at my family. Look what God has done. And we can have a feast. And what does he say? We can send some to those who have nothing. So as we go into the holidays, the season of goodwill is upon us, so we find God leading us to strategically impact our community by leaning into the needs of those around us, by giving and sharing with those who have nothing prepared. So in the next coming weeks, as we lead up to Thanksgiving, you're going to be hearing more about this 40 days of cheer and goodwill because not everybody has an abundance of joy. Not everybody has an abundance of friendship. Not everyone has the need of uh, their relationships being met and even the food that they desire. So look at the next line. He says, this day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve. So he reiterates it himself again. He says, this day is, it's a holy day, so don't cry, don't mourn. And I'm sure there were some people that were probably like, you don't know what's happened to me. You don't know what I've been going through. In fact, you may be here right now and we're leading into the holiday season, going to Thanksgiving, and you may be saying the same thing. Eric, you're saying it's time to party, but you don't know what's happened to me. And I'm not here to minimize what's happened to you or what you're going through, the mourning that you might have or the grief that you might have. I'm not here to minimize that. I'm just here to maybe reset your focus. Because this, you know, here's what he, he said it anyway. See, this, is, this, is, this day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve. And because look what he says. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. He says, it's the joy of your Lord, that, the Lord that's gonna take you through these tough times. It's the joy of the Lord that's gonna be your strength. He's not, and he's not asking them if they feel like having fun. He's not asking them, do you feel like celebrating? No, he's telling them to do what? To choose joy. 
Why? Because there's power in joy. Thank you. There's power in joy. And some of y'all been there. I've watched you. You've been in a tough, se tough season of life and you made a decision. You know what? I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to focus on, I'm going to sing anyway. I'm going to go, ew, anyway. Because you know how powerful this is. That's right. Thank you, girl. Who are you? I'm going to pay her. I like some interactiveness. Why? There's power in joy. You know, when we, this series we've been doing all year long and kind of my theme for this whole series, the kind of the root, the groundwork for this whole series has been a scripture in Ephesians, and it goes like this. He, this is what the writer of Ephesians, I mean, not Ephesians, Ecclesiastes, he said, so I recommend having fun. I could stop right there and go home. I can go, amen, that's it. Eric, I mean, <laughs> all these people have been telling me to grow up all my life. I'm just being biblical. I'm just having fun, baby. So I just recommend having fun. He goes, look at this, because there's nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. Now, he's not saying that you do that in exclusivity of all else, because he says, that way they will experience some happiness, look at this, along with all the hard work God gives them to do under the sun. So it's not a denial of hard work. It's not, the fun is not some idealistic attitude that life is easy. In fact, no, this is actually an admission that life is gonna be tough. We're gonna have some tough days. We're gonna have some tough tension. We're gonna have tension in our relationships. We're gonna, we're, and we're gonna have some tension in, at work. We're gonna have tension with our kids. We're gonna have tension with our finances, maybe some health issue. And the writer is saying, you know what? You need to find a way to have fun. You know, how many know you don't have to make a choice between being busy and having fun? We don't have to make a choice between work and having fun. Well, I gotta go to work. Well, have fun. I can't, I'm going to work. <laughs> you have to check the fun at the door where I work. No, that's not true. You make a difference. You, there's a difference between the two. Now, some people will lead you to believe that you can't go to work and have fun. But fun is an attitude. Some, in fact, uh, you, when you walked in, did you see the tent out front? We're starting to ask for people to serve because we're getting ready for our holidays. We're getting ready for Christmas. A lot of people are going to come back to church during the holidays. And so we're trying to spruce up. You saw some, the lobby's been repainted. We're sprucing up just like you do when you got family coming over for the holidays. You make your kids clean the room, you know, do the laundry, make them set the table. We're doing that. We're getting ready. So I, I make no, you know, Qualms, we're, if, if you're not serving, stop at that tent. Talk about them. Talk to them about serving because the more the merrier. But we also understand that when our teams are healthier and strong, they're going to be fun. They're going to have fun out in the parking lot. They're going to have fun on the worship team. They're going to have fun in the classrooms with your kids. And that's, that's why we always say this. You might have heard us say this. It's not what we have to do. It's what we get to do. Because serving and having fun aren't mutually exclusive. You don't have to make a choice. Well, i got to go to church. In fact, you know that some people think that going to church and having fun are mutually exclusive. <laughs> well, we can't have fun. We're going to church. We'll have fun afterwards. We'll go to AJ's or we'll go to Crab Island. That's why we do church at AJ's in Crab Island, because you can have fun at church, right? You don't have to make a choice between fun and other things that don't normally seem like fun. You know why? Because fun is an attitude. I've made funerals fun. Yeah. You ever been to a funeral and your friend says something to you and you're not supposed to laugh because it's a holy quiet time? You ever do that? I went to a friend, I had one of our best friends die and me, there was like three of us, and we were at the funeral, and my other best friend, we were at the coffin looking in, my other friend leans over and goes, he looks a lot better now than he did when he was alive. Well, that was the funniest thing I'd ever heard, but I couldn't laugh in the funeral because his parents are right there, and you're like, <laughs> and they're like, oh my God, he loved him so much. Look at him, he's up there crying. I'm like laughing. And you know what else? My friend who was in the coffin would have done the same thing. Because fun is an attitude, right? So here's what I want to do. I, you know, when I talk about a subject like this, I have a couple of goals. Number one is I want to raise your awareness of the topic. Because a lot of people don't even know this, this is in the Bible. Wait, you can have fun? So I want to raise your awareness to the topic and, uh, and, and actually inform you of why I'm bringing the topic to you and the value that it brings to your life. That's, so that's one of the goals. But the other goal 
is I want to give you some tools so that you know how to do whatever it is that I'm encouraging you to do more of in your life. So here's what I want to do today. Today I want to give you three things that you need to live your best life so that you can add joy to the journey. Because we all want to live our best life, but if you add joy to the journey, the chances of you living your best life are better, okay? So here's number one. You ready if you're taking notes? Number one is you need to add generosity into your life. You need to live... Life is so tense, but when we try to hold on, Jesus said whatever you hold on to, you're going to lose anyway. But we need to add generosity. And the reason why this is so important is because generosity is the antidote or to, to discontentment. Now, discontentment, you're saying, well, what's that? Discontentment is primarily a Western thing. It's primarily a materialistic thing. Discontentment is the reason why you go into Home Depot for one thing and you come out with 10. Because you walked in there and realized all this stuff that you didn't know you needed, all right? So discontentment, is, it's, it's what drives our marketing. It's what drives our, our advertising. Our culture constantly is pushing discontentment because when you see the stuff that you don't have, then you become discontent with what you do have. I know it happens to me. I could have a brand new whatever it is, a boat, a truck. I start looking at other things and suddenly that I hate the one I have. And you look at catalogs and, and especially in the city of Destin, in the city of Destin, you drive around and you see the car, the cars that you don't have and the houses you don't have and the boats you don't have and surfing the internet and suddenly you see these things and suddenly that boat or that car or that TV or that house that you live in doesn't cut it. And all of this goes to fuel our discontentment so that we're discontent with what we have and so we gotta have more and we gotta have more and we gotta have more but the thing is it never stops. It's insatiable, it's insanity. And the reason why it never stops is because discontentment is an appetite, right? And an appetite like food or sex. You had breakfast this morning, you're gonna probably want lunch because it's an appetite. You had sex, you're probably gonna want it again because it's an appetite. The, problem, the thing with appetites is the more you feed it, the bigger it grows. So discontentment is kind of a cure, I mean not a cure, a curse of our culture and that we keep on seeing the stuff that we don't have and we become... Uh, aware of just how far behind we are. And because discontentment is an appetite, it doesn't, it doesn't just go away. You can't just ignore it. You can't just pretend it isn't there. Just go hungry. You're like, oh, yeah, I'm not hungry. And your stomach's going, arr, arr. You, can't, you can't ignore it. The what you do with an appetite is you manage an appetite, right? If you've ever lost weight, you still eat. You just manage your appetite. See, discontentment is an appetite, and the only way to manage it is through planned and strategic generosity. Just like you plan your meals, it's a planned and strategic generosity. That's why when we talk about giving, we always talk about percentage giving. We say, hey, why don't you, the best, the wisest thing to do, you've heard me teach about this before, 100% of your income, take 10% and give it away, save 10% and live off 80. You know what you're doing? Is you're managing that appetite. Generosity is the only thing that works to manage that appetite. Why? Because our culture is constantly sending us messages of what we don't have. So that means we have to become aware of what other people don't have. The problem is Destin is a difficult place to become aware of what others don't have. Destin is the kind of place that reminds you of what you don't have. So we have to be intentional about reminding ourselves what other people don't have. So to counteract that, we have to become intentional about uh, other people's needs. One of the ways that we're intentional is about what I just talked about, the 40 days of cheer and goodwill. We're, we are, what we're doing is we're being intentional that there are people who don't have and we wanna help meet their needs. And so for the next 40 days, we're gonna ask you to get involved. There's three, way, three ways that you can be involved, you know? Three ways that you can be involved. Number one is to give. In the coming weeks, you're gonna hear about, you're gonna have an opportunity to give to some of these initiatives that will help those in need. Number two is to engage. We're gonna ask you to engage in this 40 days. Some of the ways that you can engage are, we are going to have a market set up where you can buy Christmas gifts for your loved ones and a portion of, those, of the proceeds will go to the Emerald Coast Children's Advocacy Center. So you buy Christmas presents, proceeds go to the Emerald Coast Children's Advocacy Center. Another way is every year we have a Christmas tree. And on that Christmas tree in the lobby, there are ornaments you can buy. Yeah, you can get a cheaper one at Target, but these, when you buy one of these ornaments, 
The proceeds from the sale go to help our children in foster care in this area so that they can have a good Christmas, all right? So give, engage, and the last one is invite. On your car, on your table in front of you, you have an invite card. There is a beautiful Christmas production being planned for the month of December shoreline style. And when I say shoreline style, think the greatest showman. How many were here for that? We had a production here for the, uh, a couple years ago called The Greatest Showman based off the movie, and we had thousands of people here every Sunday. We are doing that for the month of December. This is a time to invite people. Be generous with your invitations. Be generous with your presence and invite them and say, let's go to lunch. But this is available for you. That's how you can be engaged in this time of generosity. Here's the second, number two, to add joy to our life. Number two, the next thing we need to do is add levity to your heart. If you want to joy, if you want to add joy to the journey, if you want to make everything fun, you're going to have to allow levity into your heart. The word levity actually comes from a Latin word that means lightness. Why don't you look at the person next to you and say, you need to lighten up. That's what that means. You need to have some levity, right? Listen, what's the alternative not lighten up? I cannot think of one benefit. You tell me. All right, you can stop telling them now, okay? They're done. <laughs> Okay, he told me five times. I cannot tell, anyone in here, you tell me, give me one benefit of being weighed down with worry or care or anxieties. There's nothing, nothing good comes from it. Look at what Jesus said. Jesus said this in Luke, he said, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with, and then he said a few things, I just wanna hit the last one, the anxieties of life. He said, if you're not careful, the things of life, the anxieties, the worry, the pressure will weigh you down. So Jesus understands that, the, 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 uh, that life can become weighty. That's why he said he came. He said, I came that you might have what? Life and have it abundantly. Because he understands our daily challenges. He understands that we're going to struggle with relationships. We're going to struggle with our moments, our emotions. We're going to struggle with work. We're going to struggle with these things. And when our heart becomes weighed down, guess what? We're no fun to be around. Your kids don't want to be around you. Your wife doesn't want to be around you. They have to take a break from you. This is why I love being married to Darlene, because she's so much fun. <laughs> Darlene is so much fun, she makes arguing fun. I look forward to getting into an argument with my wife. I'm like, oh, good. I was like, what's for dinner? She goes, well, we're going to have this, and then you're going to complain about the meal, and we're going to get an argument. Yes! <laughs> and you know why? Let me tell you why. I've told this story before, but I think some of you need to hear it, but you need to use caution, Okay. Years ago, when we would fight when we were younger, and then you'd end up making up, but they weren't really heartfelt apologies. You know those kind of apologies, right? I'm sorry you were offended, right? They, they aren't really apologies. I'm sorry you were so insulted. That's not an apology. So we started realizing that we weren't apologizing. And the other thing we realized is that James, the book of James, Jesus' half-brother, he said the reason why you argue and fight is because you're not getting your way. And when you think about it, all your arguments come because I want something and she wants something or I want something, you want something, and I'm not getting my way, I'm upset, so I'm going to get mad about it. So th we started to think, this is silly. And one of the silly ways that we lightened it up is that somewhere along the conversation, we realized we got heated and we don't want to be there and it's stupid. One of us, it didn't matter which one, would, in, is, one would say, I'm sorry, you're such a butt. <laughs> but it, they wouldn't use the word butt. She wouldn't use the word butt. And I would say, well, I'm sorry, you're such a witch. And I didn't use the word witch. You're like, oh my God, you cuss. I love Jesus and cuss a little, okay? And what it would do, now I don't recommend you try this. We are professionals. We've been married 36 years. And especially don't try this if your wife doesn't know about it, okay? Go home and go, I'm sorry, well, it didn't work for me. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. But what it did for us was it lightened us up at the moment and went, you know what, I'm just being, you're right, I am a butt. Because I just wanted to do what I wanted to do and I wasn't thinking about your feelings. And she'd go, you're right, you are a butt. And then we'd end the conversation. <laughs> so anyway, because <laughs> you know what, if you're not playful, you're gonna have a whole lot of tension in areas where you don't need tension. If you add levity to your heart, you can actually undermine the growing tensions in your relationship. Let me, you know, I married a couple, a couple years ago a uh, friend of mine, he fly fishes, doesn't come to church, but, uh, you know, one of my fly fishing friends. And they got married, but they had been married before to each other. Like, they'd been divorced for 10 years. 
And somehow they reconnected and they were getting married again. Now, most people, when they get married again, would just probably go to the courthouse and get married again because they don't want to do all that explanation. But we did a wedding, and when we did the wedding, they, they made their vows, and they were so much fun. They were like, I take you again to be my wife again. And it was just full of that. And I just thought, you know what they're going to do? What they did was they put levity into their vows to nullify the tension. So if you want to add joy to the journey, there's generosity in your life, levity in your heart, and then number three, I think this is the most important one. I saved the best for last, and that's praise in your mouth. And I'm not just talking about worship here, okay? I'm talking about praise because they're, they're kind of two different things. Even though it's not a big deal, we mix them up, but they're two different things. See, praise is talking about God. Worship is, is uh, talking to God. Let me, I, how did I put that? Put that up there. I forgot. Praise is about God. Worship is to God. Okay, and there's a difference, and it's powerful because I love worship. But like the two songs, the two songs we sang, this is how I fight my battles. You're not telling that to God. You're singing praise about God. This is how I fight my battles. And the, third, the, the next song, this is the sound of dry bones rattling. You're not talking to God. You're talking about what God's doing. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. rattling. This is the praise a dead man makes. I'm going to walk again. Open the grave. I'm coming out. Open the grave. I'm going to live. This is the sound. See, that's praise. You're talking about how powerful God is. And there's a huge difference there. This is like what David said. David said to Psalm 100, it's, he said this. He said, um, he said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know what our joyful noise here at Shoreline is? You, right? I was up there during the first service in the, in, in the office because I was kind of late and I could hear this first song going and it would seem like they'd sing a line and everyone would go, woo! You know, that's what David was saying. He's saying, let's make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye yet land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. See, that's praise. And I really feel like we need more praise in our life. Now, some of you might think, Eric, <laughs> this is a different church. I came from a Methodist church where it's really quiet, whatever. And I think this, I'm trying to get used to this. You want more? I'm not really talking about corporately. I'm talking about individually. I think we need more praise to offset and overcome the heaviness that we encounter in life. I mean, this is, one of the, this is why I'm submitting this to you. I think this is the most important of the three, that if we wanna add journey, I mean, add joy to the journey, praise is not just limited to a church service. The praises of God can be on our lips for 24 seven. And the praise is good for you. The prophet Isaiah, he said this, to take off the garment of praise and put on the spirit of, Oh, no, sorry, <laughs> to put it out the other way. Take off the spirit of heaviness and put on the garment of praise. In other words, the garment of praise is for the spirit of heaviness. You know, somewhere along the way, Eric and Graham decided to wear the same clothes, okay? The, he does look like Danny DeVito, doesn't he? They decided they had to put those shirts on. The prophet Isaiah is saying, you've got to choose joy. And the way you choose joy is to put on the garment of praise. It's a choice. You don't come here and wait for someone to put it on you. You put it on, okay? And I think if we're gonna add joy to the journey, we need to realize, especially coming to Thanksgiving, I got a lot to be thankful for. I got a lot to be able to praise God about. And it can be different things. I'm, you know, I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful for my wife. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for my children. I'm really thankful for my pastor. I mean, we can all make some lists of why we should be thankful because they come from the hand of God. Now, here's what the psalmist said, and I love this, and we're gonna close with this. David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Now, one of the things I like about that, not only can we add praise to our life when we're outside church, but there's something about coming together and magnifying the Lord together. He says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt or lift up his name together because when we come together, we take our eyes off our issues because listen, you know what magnify means? It literally means to make God bigger. Yeah. It literally means to take God who might be out here right now in your view and magnify him in your heart and your mind. See, when we don't praise God, what happens is God begins to shrink and oftentimes what we do while God is shrinking, we magnify our problems. We bring those problems and we make them bigger and God is small out here. And then we wonder why God can't do anything about our issues. 
See, the only limitations on the power of God working in your life is the ones that you place on him when you minimize him and you maximize and magnify your problems. Praise is the ability to bring God close and magnify his greatness and his awesomeness and how, how awesome he is in every, for every aspect of our life. And when we praise him, we're bringing him close and making him the most important. Now, it doesn't mean that those things go away or that we're, we're ignoring them, but it just makes, because what does it say? Our God, the song that we sang today, there's a miracle in this house. Our God is able. All, that's all you're doing is reminding yourself that God is bigger than that issue. And you know, I think we can all be better at our, our roles. Uh, as husband, I, 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 we have, I have a men's breakfast that I pray at every Sunday, I mean every Tuesday, at uh, La pa Local market. We meet at seven in the morning, we do a Bible study and we pray. And almost every Tuesday, the prayer that I pray is, God, that we would be better men, we would be better fathers, husbands, sons, leaders, bosses, employees. We can all do better. And I really believe that if we could just take these three things, generosity in our life, levity in your heart, and praise in your mouth, that we can, we can add joy to the journey. And I'm telling you, listen, th this is not just, if you, you call Shoreline your home, this is your church, or you're watching online, it's not just some, uh, hey, great sermon, Pastor Eric. I, I don't want that. I mean, you can do it if you want, but I, that's not the purpose, okay? And I don't, even, I don't even want to come across, I have the danger of coming across of, hey, want to live your best life? Here's these three easy steps. That's not the point of this message either. Can you imagine if this became a lifestyle? I mean, we're talking about 40 days of goodwill and cheer and goodwill. It should be 365 days of cheer and goodwill. That's the way it should be for us. But it starts with us realizing and being intentional about adding joy to the journey by adding generosity, lightening up, and living a life of praise. Could you imagine the difference we'd make in our community if we just took these three things? Can you imagine? Because I already, let me just tell you, I already hear about your generosity. I say your generosity. Because I can go to a restaurant, I can be somewhere and then go, oh, you're from, pastor from Shoreline? You, you guys fed us when we were out of work during COVID. Or you did, and I hear about your generosity, but that, if I had any reputation for our church, I, I would want it to be that we were just so generous. I, I, may, I don't believe what they believe, but boy, that church is generous. Can you imagine if we were a church that always had fun? I mean, <laughs> people would probably think we're a cult. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Must be strange because they like going to church and having fun. It's weird. <laughs> probably a cult or something. Why? Because it's so counterintuitive. No one thinks of fun and church in the same word. Why do you think we have a freaking slide in our sanctuary? <laughs> that wasn't there from the nightclub. There were stairs there. We pulled them out and put a slide in. Why? Because we wanted to have fun. We actually had a lady who goes, I didn't understand why we spent money on that. And then I went down and I was like, whoa! <laughs> Dress flew up around her head. <laughs> Generous, fun, and praising God for the blessings that he's given us. You know, COVID's been hard. 2021 has been hard. 2022 has been hard. But I guarantee you there are some things to be thankful for. You know, let's add to the joy of the journey. Let's add joy to the journey and then we'll live our best life because I'm gonna leave you with this. Life is a gift from God. I know that because I'm 60 now and I realize that every day I wake up is a good day because I thought 60, you start to get old and die. Anybody thought that when you're there? Okay, well, we're all dying. Life is a gift from God. What you do with it is your gift back to him. So what are you gonna do with that gift? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can have fun. Thank you so much that we can come here and laugh. Thank you, you know, I just, I just, I get a picture of Jesus. You know, I think one of the mistakes is that the picture of Jesus has always been so holy and solemn, and I know he's holy, but I just think Jesus was probably fun to be around. You know, I think that when he turned water into wine, <laughs> that had to be a fun time, don't you? And it was good wine, too. It wasn't non-alcoholic. I'm not trying to promote drinking, I'm just saying... Jesus, fun to be around. Lord, we, we want to be fun to be around. We want, you, we, we want to be fun, and Lord, we want to add fun to the journey and add joy to the journey and purpose in our lives so that we can live intentional and live our best life ever, ever that glorifies you. So God, we want to be like you. You gave your best, your son. You were generous. You didn't hold back. Lord, we don't either. Lord, we also want to live a life that's abundant, abundant life that's so attractive, just like Jesus was. And Lord, we want to praise you. 
We want to give you thanksgiving, not just because it's a holiday, because it's a lifestyle, because you have truly blessed us. You've taken us out of darkness and into light, and we didn't do one thing to deserve it, and so we're so grateful. Father, we love you and honor you in Jesus' name. Amen.